moved to Denmark, but uh, Lere, I have the pressure to wel- the pleasure to welcome you. Um, actually, you're originally from Spain as well, uh, but uh, living now for many years in Denmark and uh, working for the Danish Focus Center first, and at the moment working as a researcher um, who is doing in-depth research, I think very, very important research on uh, renewable energy in general, in particular with the focus on the socio-economic aspects of um, community energy. There, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for the invitation. Let me see if I can see how to share my screen. Um, Can you see it now? Yes. Great. So uh, first of all, I would like just to give a short um, introduction on um, the energy system in Denmark and also uh, citizen ownership in this country. So as you may know, uh, Denmark has set the target to reduce CO2 emissions by 70% by 2030. In 2018, uh, renewable energy supplied about 36% of the total energy demand. And last year, um, wind power supplied 47% of the final electricity demand of the country. At the same time, we also see some positive figures, for instance, in district heating, as 64% of all the um, households in the country are connected to this type of system. So in general, very good figures, but I also wanted to point out that uh, sector integration is not so good yet. Uh, For instance, in 2018, heat pumps only accounted for 0.1% of the district heating demand. So there is um, some work to be done as well. When it comes to citizen ownership, um, in this research that uh, we did together with some colleagues, um, we quantified uh, wind ownership And that was 52% of the total installed wind capacity had citizen ownership in December 2016. And the same year, 96% of the district heating demand was supplied by municipal companies and consumer cooperatives. So rather high numbers as it's uh, commonly known um, uh, from Denmark. And apart from that, in this um, study, what we did also was to analyze how ownership had uh, changed since the middle of the 70s and up to 2006. And there we found out some um, interesting things, like for instance, that uh, particularly for wind power, the characteristics of citizen ownership had changed quite a lot. Uh, One of the reasons was, of course, changes in policies and regulations, but there were also others. So um, an important result from this research was that we could identify three dimensions that are very important to differentiate uh, the different types of uh, citizen ownership that we can find. So one is of course uh, very well known. So we have uh, local uh, types of projects or we can have citizen ownership Uh, for projects that are outside the the area where they live or where they have the main um, economic activities. We can also see uh, a difference between exclusive citizen ownership projects where only a few individuals are engaged and participate and inclusive ownership um, where more people are uh, part of it and can benefit from it. And finally, we can also see differences between the type of profits and how profits are shared, if it is individual profit or if it is um, shared uh, in terms like uh, common good projects and so on. So, of course, these differences are very important when it comes to the type of outcomes that we can expect from the different types uh, of projects. So, if we want to achieve local acceptance uh, of new energy, Uh, technologies, for instance, we would need to go to the top right corner where we have local ownership, but also inclusive types of ownership. But then if we uh, rather want to accelerate the implementation of uh, wind power, for instance, we might want to have um, access to larger amounts of capital, and then we might consider to open it to other types of uh, citizen ownership as well. 
So um, now coming to innovation in community ownership, we know that the energy transition uh, is opening for a lot of new opportunities, but at the same time, it's also creating uh, new challenges. And this, of course, uh, creates spaces for innovation, but also requires some innovation. And what I would like to uh, present today is some uh, related to the challenges that we see in onshore wind power. So we see that as variable renewable electricity generation, um, more and more of this type of electricity is integrated in the energy systems, and particularly in this case, onshore wind power, uh, this technology is experiencing greater local opposition uh, and at the same time receiving lower market prices due to the merit order effect and uh, being curtailed more and more often due to the grid congestions. So as I said before, we know that uh, for a local opposition, we need to have more local involvement, more open uh, planning processes, but also ownership. Uh, and then for lower market prices and grid issues, um, we know that one of the good solutions that we could implement is sector integration. But there are still a lot of questions um, in relation to sector integration, like what kind of organizational characteristics should such a system have um, and what kind of ownership as well. Uh, what kind of policies are actually um, suitable for these kind of uh, systems and among others, how does location of the different uh, types of energy infrastructure also affect the possibility for this sector integration to address the challenges that I have mentioned before. So in this context, um, well, we found out some interesting news in August 2018. In a general assembly, the consumer-owned district heating company in the town of Videsane decided to purchase the local wind turbines. And that was very new. Uh, as far as I know, it's uh, for now the only district heating in Denmark uh, that has decided to take such a decision. And there were two reasons for that. Uh, the first one is related to the economy of the wind turbines. As I was saying in my previous slide, um, there are different challenges and one of them is the very low uh, spot market prices that have uh, been observed in the last years, like you can see um, on the graph on the right side, which are even below the levelized cost of uh, wind power. And the other one was uh, the green values of the local district heating company. This, uh, the district heating is located um, at less than one kilometer away from the wind turbines. And there were days where they could see that the wind was blowing the wind turbines were stopped and at the same time their uh, electric boiler was not running because uh, it was not economically um, reasonable at that point and at the same time they had to use the natural gas boilers to meet their uh, heat demand. So uh, talking to each other they found out that yeah maybe it was a good idea actually that uh, the district heating company could buy the wind turbines and in this way, uh, make some revenues from selling electricity to the spot market when the prices were good, and then uh, self-consuming the electricity when the prices in the spot market were low. So this, of course, for people uh, who are investigating or analyzing ownership and the changes that are happening in the context of the energy transition brought out a lot of interesting questions like what are the benefits of the co-ownership of wind turbines and district heating systems and how does the location influence or how do the current Danish policies and regulations encourage or discourage co-ownership solutions and many others. So that's what um, those are some of the questions that I tried to uh, answer in this uh, new paper which is freely available if you're interested. And what I did was through uh, analysis of literature and interviewing several um, stakeholders, I analyzed three different models of uh, co-ownership, which you can see um, on the diagram on the right. So the first one, uh, which I called distant integration, is where we have the wind turbines connected to a distribution grid 
and the district heating system with the heat pump or the electric boiler in a different distribution grid, and these two are connected by a transmission grid in the middle. A second one, which I called local integration, where both the wind turbines and the district heating system are in the same distribution grid, but they are using uh, the local uh, public network to interact. And finally, a behind the meter integration solution, which is the one that was finally implemented in Bidasane, where they have a private cable going from the wind turbines to the district heating system. And here I try to um, analyze if these different locations and this uh, co-ownership uh, model would give any benefits compared to the current situation when it comes to addressing the organizational challenges of the um, smart energy systems like reducing grid issues, reducing local opposition to wind turbines, and then increasing the attractiveness of investments both in wind turbines and power to heat um, industry heating systems. So of course, uh, the first thing that um, I found was that both uh, the three models could be helpful to address uh, congestions that happen between market zones. But then when we come to congestions and um, grid issues that are more local, we need to look into either local integration or behind the meter integration. I have to say that in the case of Denmark, behind the meter integration is not considered um, totally necessary because the congestions don't actually happen in the point of connection between the wind turbine and the grid. And then of course, uh, when it comes to local opposition, then we would need some kind of local and inclusive ownership which both uh, the local district heating company uh, could provide in either local integration or behind the meter. I have to say that here there is a, a difference between these two because when we are talking about behind the meter, the um, uh, district heating system and the wind turbines will be closed, which means that the district heating consumers are also the ones that are close to the wind turbines and the ones that will benefit uh, from uh, owning the wind turbines by the district heating system. Whereas when we go to a local integration, it could happen that the wind turbines are placed outside um, of the urban area where the district heating system is, and therefore people out there could have individual heating. So in order to create a balance uh, of benefits in the local community, uh, we should try to find solutions to also uh, engage the people with individual heating in that case and give them some uh, benefits. And finally, um, it could also be interesting since we are coupling flexible demand with a source of electricity, which in Denmark is actually the cheapest source of energy. So in principle or in theory, there could be some benefit there from this co-ownership as well. So as I say, um, in theory, um, it could be interesting or we could actually get some benefits from the combination of local cross-sector integration and the co-ownership solution uh, for grid issues, for um, uh, increasing the economic attractiveness, also for uh, improved utilization of local wind power, reduction of burning of fuels, the economy of the district heating consumers, um, the local electricity consumers, and of course for acceptance. So in theory, um, this type uh, of co-ownership could actually accelerate the implementation of a renewable energy system with integrated sectors. But then what happens when we try to analyze this um, in the context of the existing policies and regulations? Well, we see that um, several of these um, benefits, especially uh, related to the economy and the attractiveness, uh, doesn't work. Uh, we saw, for instance, um, that electricity grid tariffs and taxes uh, make it less attractive to invest um, in heat pumps or electric boilers. This is uh, slowly changing. Uh, but still, um, it doesn't matter whether you consume electricity from a wind turbine that it is um, two kilometers away 
from the district heating system or it is at 300 kilometers because the electricity tariffs and taxes that you are paying are going to be the same. So there is no incentive for local consumption, let's say at this point. And then we see also, uh, for instance, that the electricity spot market, which has been designed for a fossil fuel energy system, results in prices that are well below uh, the levelized cost of wind power. Uh, and at least that happened for several hours in the last years. So why would a um, consumer with a flexible consumption choose to own wind turbines instead of just purchasing uh, cheap electricity from the spot market? And of course, there are a few more, but I don't want to get too and much um, you can completed conclude. with that. Con conclude, yes. Yeah. So, so um, some of the conclusions here were that since we are changing from a fossil fuel energy system into a renewable energy system with integrated sectors, which is very different in terms of technical characteristics, then we need to redesign the institutional conditions and we need to reconsider the organization of the energy system as well, including uh, the ownership. That's of course not new because many others have also reached uh, that conclusion. And as I said, a few more questions here um, would be what are, because the results are only preliminary, so what are the implications of the co-ownership solution for district heating and electricity consumers beyond what I have studied here? And also something interesting, uh, would single sector energy companies benefit from transitioning to cross sector energy companies? And then, um, I don't know, Stefan, if you want me to say something about uh, the value of community energy. If you try to be very brief because we're a bit now. Yeah. <laughs> so this was not, um, this is more personal reflections rather than based on um, any research that I have done. But I think that um, this type of local and inclusive citizen um, ownership of energy can help us create more resilient communities, like others have said, and also more just um, societies. Among others, um, because of participatory and democratic decision making, because we can have common good projects that can address problems like local development, job creation, energy poverty, and we can reinforce um, the relationships between local businesses and people and so on. And most importantly, I think that these uh, positive dynamics that can be created in community energy projects can be also beneficial to address the challenges that we have beyond um, energy or climate issues. So. Thank you so much, Leire. I think that is it's extremely important that the work that you're doing uh, because uh, there's not so much people, it's not so many researchers who are trying really to systematically work on that. Um, so thank you and, and good luck with your ongoing work. I know that as you said, uh, you're just one, I mean, you're not at the end of your project, mm -hmm. but it's really important milestone, I think, uh, for all of us that such projects are undertaken and also giving us these interesting insights into what are the, the um, what is the relation between certain type of technological approaches and those socioeconomic aspects. Thank you.